other people as we go along. Um, and um, I just want to take a few minutes to uh, thank our supporting members that help make all our work possible. So let me do that for a moment. And I would ask that everybody uh, try to stay muted if you're not speaking so that we can reduce distractions for everybody else. Thank you. So I'm excited to welcome you here for a program that's going to bring together um, the past and the present in terms of um, uh, Jewish loan societies, a form of mutual aid that has played a particularly important role in Jewish history across uh, North America and elsewhere, and that is uh, continues to play an important role in Jewish communities today. Um, and that thanks to the Federation's efforts is um, playing a new role in our community now. So, um, uh, so we're gonna be looking both at the history, sorry, I jumped ahead there a little bit. We're gonna be looking both at the history and at the present um, day of Jewish loan societies, both uh, generally speaking and in the Hartford region. Um, and for the first part to talk about the history, it's my pleasure to welcome uh, tonight, uh, Professor Shelley Tenenbaum from Clark University. She's a professor in the Department of Sociology. She holds a PhD from Brandeis University. And she also coordinates undergraduate activities for the Strassler Family Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies, as well being, as being involved in the women's and gender studies and Jewish studies and in race and ethnic relations at Clark University. And she's the author of this book that you see on the left side of the screen, a credit to their community, Jewish loan societies in the United States. And she's gonna talk with us for about 20 minutes um, to give us a little bit of an overview on different kinds of Jewish loan um, organizations um, and the role they played historically. And then we can take some questions if you have any at that point, and then I will share a little bit more information about activities in the Hartford region that I know from our collection. And then we will um, uh, get some comments about that and share some memories about that. And then uh, hear from our friends at Federation about um, the current activities of the Jewish Loan Society. So uh, Shelley, floor is yours. Thank you. I'll stop sharing this for the moment. So thank you. Thank you all for inviting me um, to share some remarks and particular thanks to Elizabeth Rose for organizing this event and for the kind introduction. So during the 1920s, Mae Berman who was separated from her husband and the mother of five children needed to borrow $100 to purchase merchandise for her electrical supply store in Pittsburgh. Seattle resident, Morris Posner, he wanted $250 to buy goods for his poultry business. And the manufacturer of nightgowns and bloomers, Charles Kaminer sought a source of funds to run his New York shop. So all three of these early 20th century entrepreneurs in communities such as Pittsburgh, Seattle, New York City, they needed funds for their entrepreneurial um, um, businesses. And all of them, all three of these individuals were successful in getting credit through their local Hebrew Free Loan Associations. And Hebrew Free Loan Societies, that my guess is, is familiar to most of you, if not all of you here, but I would call them semi-philanthropic organizations. And I'll explain that more in a minute but they're based on a biblical and a Talmudic prohibition against lo Jews loaning uh, money to other Jews with interest. So because of these Hebrew free loan societies, because they had access to ethnic credit, they were indeed able to take advantage of entrepreneurial opportunities. And this occurred throughout the United States. So beginning in the 1880s, East European immigrants created Hebrew free loan societies throughout the United States. They existed in the very large metropolitan areas of Chicago, New York, Boston. I found them in really small communities such as 
Altoona, Pennsylvania, in Shreveport, Louisiana, Elmira, New York. They existed in other communities such as um, Hartford as well. Many of these Hebrew Free Loan Societies were affiliated with other Jewish institutions. Somewhat like now, the Jewish Free Loan in Hartford will be affiliated with Federation. In the past, they were affiliated with synagogues, with Landsmannschaften, which were organizations based on um, hometowns or home cities back in Eastern Europe. Um, some of them were affiliated with relief societies, some of them even with family clubs. But the largest Hebrew free loan societies during my period were independent of any organizations. Now I call them semi-philanthropic. I'm not sure it's the right term and you may come up with a better term, but I call them semi-philanthropic because in some ways they're traditional philanthropies. There's one group of people who are donors and contribute the funds that makes them a charity. But unlike most charities where money is given without any ex expectation that it would be returned, with Hebrew free loan societies, obviously people pay back the loans and the money is used over and over again, sometimes up to six times a year. That same pot of money um, could be loaned out to different people. The money is then loaned without interest to approved borrowers. Most Hebrew free loan societies, not all during my period, I'll be curious to hear what the plan will be um, in Hartford um, um, as, we, as you move forward. But in general, the borrowers were not investigated. That was seen to be prying into their personal business, that it undermined dignity. So actually the borrowers generally were not investigated. It was the endorsers who were investigated. So in order to get a loan, you had to have approved endorsers. And it was the endorsers who were ultimately responsible for the loan in case the borrower ended up defaulting. But again, during my period, the default rate was so low. It was generally under 1%. And I'm convinced that the reason the default rate was so low is precisely because it was built on mutual trust. These are bonds of mutual trust. Unlike owing money to a bank or to an institution that's more impersonal, obviously someone was not going to endorse a loan unless they knew the borrower. And it was unlikely then that the borrower would default on someone who they knew and who trusted them and they trusted that particular person. So there were actually very low default rates. Many of the Hebrew Free Loan Societies during my period used religion as a criterion for approval. In other words, most loaned money only to other Jews, but there were some actually who loaned money to non-Jews as well. And it was a sidebar in uh, my research, but it was interesting. There's actually a big debate among free loan activists about whether or not to have people who were not Jewish as borrowers. Some people, some organizations or some leaders of organizations claim that it actually would mitigate anti-Semitism. It would show goodwill by allowing people who were not Jewish to obtain loans. Others thought exactly the opposite. What would happen if someone who wasn't Jewish defaulted on a loan, it would bring up age old anti-Semitism of Jews as money lenders and thought it was the worst possible idea. Some, used all, I don't know, at least to my ear today sounds bizarre, but it was not so bizarre for the late 19th and early 20th century, used that blood discourse that was very popular that somehow it was only Jews and they really would talk about by virtue of their blood could really understand a Hebrew free loan system. So it really was a debate. And I'll, again, I'll be curious to hear what the plans are um, in Hartford. So New York. At the time, again, that I was writing, again, remember my book was between 1880 and 1945. During this period, New York was the home to about 40% of American Jews. And not surprisingly, it had the largest free loan society in the country. So just to give you some sense of amounts of money, between 1892 and 1892 was when the New York Hebrew Free Loan Society began and 1940, the New York Hebrew Free Loan Society dispersed about six, 670,000 loans. So about 670,000 loans 
for a total of $32 million. In one year, in 1925, the New York Hebrew Free Loan Society gave out a million dollars in loans. I'm just trying to give you a sense of the magnitude, and that was the largest of the organizations. If you can, keep that number in mind, we will later compare it to credit unions sometimes known as oxies. If that name is, word is not familiar, I guarantee it will be soon. Hartford. So Hartford not only had a free loan association, it also had a ladies free loan society during the period um, of my research. The ladies Hebrew free loan was created in 1908. And as I indicated by the name, women as well as men were involved as not only as borrowers of free loans, but as lenders. And I'll be honest, that was a surprise to me. When I embarked on this research, I thought I was writing a book about men that we were dealing with credit during this period. It was my assumption. And oftentimes the most interesting parts of a research project is what you don't expect. And I was actually surprised by how often women did appear as borrowers. They were a minority but a significant minority of borrowers of the male administered free loan societies. And they were also, again, um, administrators of women's free loan societies. Just to give you a sense, in addition to Hartford, I found records of ladies free loans. And here are the cities, pretty extensive. Baltimore, Boston, Chicago, Cleveland, Columbus, Jersey City, Lawrence, Massachusetts, Los Angeles, New York, Omaha, Philadelphia, Providence, Rochester, Salem, Mass, Scranton, Pennsylvania, Seattle, South Bend, Indiana, and Springfield, Mass. I hope you wrote those down because you'll get a little test at the end. So you have to get at least three of them. I am kidding. Okay. But I can't resist telling you about one in particular. This is one of my favorite parts of the, um, of the work that I did. And that relates to the Chicago Women's uh, Loan Association. The Chicago Women's Loan Association was created in um, 1897. It was one of the earliest of these women's credit um, organizations. The Chicago Women's Loan Association, like most of the women's free loan societies, were administered solely by women. By the way, most, not all, dispersed loans, though, to women and men. Some, a minority, only gave loans to women. So really what's key, for the most part, that makes it a woman's or a lady's free loan is that it was administered by women. Um, and then, okay, now this is one of my favorite parts. Try to imagine this conference of Jewish social workers, 1914. It's an annual conference, the National Conference of Jewish Charities. And Minnie Lowe, one of the founders of the Chicago Women's Loan Society, this is 1914, right? Women still don't even have the vote, right? Pre-suffrage. And she gets up in front of this association, largely male, and boldly defended the Chicago Women's Loan Fund's policy of um, only allowing women to be administrators um, or to run the organization. And if you'll bear with me, I'm just gonna read you this quote from Minnie Lowe in eight, from 1914 at the National Conference for Jewish Charities. Okay, I love this one. She says, no man has ever had an active voice in the affairs of this association as contributing members men have been granted the courtesy of affixing their names to the subscription list. Otherwise, all privileges have been denied them. What bearing women's emancipation in our state will have on extending the privilege of the vote to the sterner sex, the future alone will tell. At the present time, the sentiment is still against the open door policy. And right, so what many laws say, you give us the vote, maybe we'll let you, you know, help run the Women's Loan um, Association. So um, it is a very colorful um, quote. A detail. Pauline Perlmutter Steinem, born in Poland, and the grandmother of noted feminist Gloria Steinem, 
was president of the Jewish Free Loan Association in Toledo, Ohio. But however, she really was an anomaly. She's really one of the few women I found who rose to a leadership position in, um, uh, that was not within a women's institution. That actually was not that common, but maybe like her granddaughter, uh, she too had stood out for her particular time. Okay, so Hebrew Free Loan Societies, think of these are really, um, they come out of Jewish tradition. As I said, they're rooted in the Bible, in the Talmud, they existed in Eastern Europe, they were brought over here, right? They really are tradition, rooted in Jewish tradition. But Jewish Jews, and especially as Jews were moving into business, they needed other sources of credit. And that meant they also moved beyond these traditional loan organizations and also created Jewish credit unions, Jewish credit cooperatives. You might say that they have some root in Jewish tradition because of a sense of social justice, but there are no texts, right? There's nothing in Jewish tradition that says, that commands Jews to have credit cooperatives, right? So they also moved beyond their tradition to create other types of Jewish credit associations. You may know, may not, Edward A. Filene from Filene's department store, German Jew. He's actually considered to be the founder of the credit union, the whole credit union movement in the United States. There's even a plaque for him honoring his role as being a founder or the father of the Jewish, excuse me, the founder of the credit union movement in the um, um, Boston Common. Uh, you can find it. And basically he tapped this, he, he went to a trip to India, was introduced to this notion of credit cooperatives in India, was enamored by the idea, brought it back to the United States, tapped his other Jewish, German Jewish friends, and they actually created um, the credit union movement in the United States. Technically, an organization did not become a credit union until it was legally incorporated, until it had bylaws, a state charter, was legally incorporated um, either under a state's credit union law or after 1934, according to federal law. But before many credit unions became credit unions, became official, became formalized, they had actually existed in an informal basis, right? Pre being incorporated, pre being um, um, chartered. And that's um, what an OXIE is. You can spell it O-X-I-E. In my book, I spell it A-K-T-S-I. And I use that spelling because basically it's short for the German word Aktien Gesellschaft, right? A society of shareholders um, is where um, it comes from. So the distinction, it's a very simple one. The distinction between a credit union and an Aktie is the credit union is government regulated while an Aktie is informal is not under any state or legal jurisdiction. Hartford's Kiev um, Protective Mutual Benefits Society was first an OCSI until it became um, incorporated after Connecticut passed its regulatory um, law. So it was an OCSI for many years before it became a formalized legal credit union. And that's a whole history in terms of why that regulation happened, but you could imagine people absconding with money, you know, things happening. And there was a sense that there was a need to have some state regulation here when we're dealing with lending money. So estimates of the annual amount loaned by Oxys in the 1920s, range from 20 to $30 million a year, far more than Hebrew Free Loan Societies. If you remember, in one year, the New York Hebrew Free Loan, which was by far the largest of all the free loans, dispersed $1 million. In one year, the Oxys dispersed 20 to $30 million. But Oxys were more than just economic organizations. They also had a social function. So one former member of a Hartford Oxy, 
reminisces and also another one of my favorite quotes. It's much shorter than the previous one. Reminisces, and I quote, we would get together in somebody's home, get our business done, and then we'd all have a little schnapps, right? So these indeed were social organizations as well as economic organizations. And a matter of fact, some members and leaders of Oxys were not happy with government regulation because they were worried that that social function would really be diminished by having a hierarchy, you know, by having bylaws. Also, once you're under state regulation, you know, you have to open your doors to anyone. It can no longer be a Jewish organization. So there was concern that it would change the nature of um, the Oxys. So again, I'm a sociologist, as um, Elizabeth uh, said via her introduction. I can pass as a historian. You can call me a historical sociologist or a social historian. But as a sociologist, I care about broader social processes. And I hope that even this short talk gives you some sense of transformation. So even we often tend to think of Jewish behavior as being bounded you know, by Jewish tradition. And yes, of course, with Hebrew free loan societies, Jewish tradition was indeed very important, but Jews also went outside of those parameters. And when they need additional organizations, they move beyond the scope of Jewish culture and Jewish tradition. Um, so transformation is a process that's ever present in the American Jewish experience. And not surprisingly, it's also true for Jewish loan societies. Again, we see that OXIs became credit unions. We see that beyond my period after World War II, Hebrew free loan societies changed. After World War II, banks were transformed, actually after even the Great Depression. There was a huge change in American banking policies. And while banks during the uh, late 19th, early 20th century, it wasn't just that because of anti-Semitism, they didn't provide personal loans. That wasn't the function, that only changed later. So once Jews, as well as other Americans, had access to banks, which of course could create, excuse me, could, which could of course give out much higher sums of money, Jewish loan societies became much less important for entrepreneurship. But they changed, they transformed with the times. So some Hebrew free loan societies have designed innovative programs to meet contemporary needs. They give out student loans. They sometimes give out housing loans. They sometimes provide loans even to Jewish institutions um, for uh, day school tuition, for Jewish summer camp um, expenses. There was one program um, in Cleveland, the Cleveland Hebrew Free Loan Association developed a program in conjunction with the Cleveland Society for the Blind to provide the visually impaired with loans to purchase expensive equipment. So again, um, the uh, purpose of the Hebrew Free Loan Societies has changed over time. So I'm going to turn the floor now to you because I'm really eager to hear from you because I know there are many people um, in the audience who know a great deal about um, the Hebrew Free Loan in Hartford, the history, also know about the history of Oxys, and I'm really also eager to hear about the plans for the newly emergent um, Jewish Free Loan Fund in Hartford. So thank you very much for listening to the presentation. Sorry, I was muted, but thank you, Shelly, for that wonderful overview. And um, I'm just gonna give a quick uh, run through a little material that I have um, uh, learned in, from our collection. Um, and uh, Shelley Tenenbaum mentioned the Hebrew Ladies Free Loan Association in Hartford. And we do have a collection of their ledger books at the Jewish Historical Society. And recently, um, uh, I noted in one of these ledger books, the date 1908 in yeah. this uh, a Yiddish script, which I could not myself read, but fortunately we were able to get it translated by Connie Smilowitz. Um, and while the ledger books date till later, I was glad to get that earlier information about its history. 
And I think anyone who is involved with any nonprofit organization in any context can relate to this quote, um, <laughs> in which they said, we saw that no one is coming to help. So we began to consider whether we should exist because it's one of the greatest mitzvot, tzedakah, both for the rich and the poor. It's not a shame to borrow money at a needy time. And some of this, uh, this went on to talk about you know, who was the president and the vice president and so on, but they shouldn't be doing it for the glory of these titles. They should be doing it for the greater good. Um, so it's a very relatable um, uh, kind of <laughs> passage from the past. Um, and this is a, an article that appeared in the newspaper in the 1930s with some of the, um, uh, the leadership of the Hebrew Ladies Free Loan Association. Um, so if you're interested in that, like I said, we do have their ledger books going from the late 1920s through the 1950s into the 1960s um, in a mixture of Yiddish and English, it, it shifted over time. Um, and um, we also note that in Manchester, Connecticut, uh, before a synagogue was organized there, there was a, um, a Hebrew Free Loan Association that seems to have been one of the first um, uh, organizing impulses of the of the pretty small Jewish community in Manchester um, around uh, 1910, which was uh, noted in the newspaper as well, and it's noted in the history of the synagogue um, as one of the as one of its uh, sort of antecedents. So I thought that was interesting as well. Um, and then um, we have a number of accounts from our our significant oral history collection, um, and this is. Uh, that refer to the axes as, as Professor Tenenbaum was talking about. And I don't know if you can see all of this, depending if you're, how you're seeing the Zoom screen, but um, this is from an interview with uh, Hyman Kernitsky, and he was very involved with the Kiev Mutual Protective Benefit Association, if I have that name right. Um, and he talked about the prevalence of axes throughout Hartford, he said, Every night in the labor lyceum, in synagogues and homes and in basements, they had oxies. He said there were about 50 of them operating in Hartford, about 120 in Connecticut. Um, they were formed for the little guys. He said they didn't want to go to the banks because there you have to give them your life history. So there's that sort of sense that uh, things are too bureaucratic and perhaps intrusive in the bank and that the oxy was a more comfortable um, place to go. Um, I'd like to thank Susan Viner, who I think is on the call tonight, for pointing out to me that there are several references in the book that she uh, edited for the Historical Society, Revisiting Our Neighborhoods. Um, and uh, Stephen Ossett here talks about um, uh, banks, you know, not lending to, to Jewish people and um, that his father helped someone borrow from the Oxy. Uh, to start an appliance store and and they never um as a result they never his family never paid uh, very much for anything at that store the, there's a lot of gratitude for that um and another account by a woman who um borrowed money every year to go on to be able to go on vacation um down at the shore with uh with their family um and uh they would make a payment every week um on the loan and um and that enabled them to uh pay for a room in a uh, in a rooming house uh, in, in the summer. And, um, and then it was also, as everyone who talked about this points out, it's also a social environment for, um, uh, for the people involved with the schnapps and everything. <laughs> so, um, so I'd like to, uh, I'm gonna stop sharing there and see if I could ask Naomi Cohen, who's uh, the daughter of Hyman Kernitsky to talk a little bit about what she might remember from her um, uh, from her family's involvement in the Kiev Axi. And Naomi, I'm trying to find you so I can unmute. Ask I unmuted you. me. Great, there you go, thank you. I'm very shy, but I'm trying to come out of my shell. Uh, thank you very much. I am the granddaughter of one of the six men who started the Kiev. My grandfather, Abraham Dubrow, was one of 10 children of a Russian couple named Leba and uh, Sarah Dubrow. And my grandfather and one of his brothers, there were five brothers and five sisters, came to the Hartford area um, and um, they were the first. Eventually, seven of the 10 children came. 
The other three, interestingly, went to Latvia and apparently made a lot of money. Uh, <laughs> my grandfather was a milkman. And by milkman, it meant he had a, they had a wooden edifice in their backyard. They drove a truck to farms in the Litchfield area, picked up the milk, brought it back to the milk room, pasteurized it, bottled it, and delivered it. And he knew, as did these other five men, that it was very hard to borrow money when you had no collateral. And so they started this oxy. And I just remember when it used to be in the basement of the Barber Street Synagogue in the north end of Hartford. And my father always said, when he got engaged to my mother, my grandfather took him to the oxy meeting because they met every month. And he goes, oh, you know, this is going to be my son-in-law. They go, welcome. Because it was very much of a, if you knew somebody and you could vouch for them, you were in to the oxy. And um, it moved over time out of synagogue basements. The last two places where my father were involved were in office buildings in Bluefield. Um, and they met every week. They had a loan committee that talked over whether you could get the loan. They had members. You had to be a member to have a leg up to be able to borrow from the Oxy. And we had shares, $25 got you a share. And when Michael and I got married, I remember my father said, oh, you have to join the Oxy. So we joined the Oxy, our kids joined the Oxy because my father was always worried if we had to borrow money, we had to be members. Um, and the most they ever loaned, I think, was about $20,000. But most people took the small loans about which you spoke. And it was very social because people would come in every week to pay their money, and then they'd sit around and talk. Especially in their last two venues, they had a uh, bookkeeper. So the Oxy was open during the week and during the day as well. And people used to come in and sit around and talk. And every year they had a end of the year annual meeting. This was the highlight of my father's life. <laughs> Delicatessen and sour pickles. And um, people would come to the annual meeting, but so you had to be a member to be able to do that. Um, I thought what was interesting about what I remember is my father used to go out and collect money. If you could not get yourself to the Oxy to pay the money, my father would come to you. And so would several of the other officers. So they went out, they picked up money. They said to people, if you can't pay the whole thing, you have to pay something every week. And I think what Shelley said was act a very on point that it was the co-signer who they really cared about. In fact, when we got married, my father gave me the advice of don't co-sign for anybody, right. your husband. Um, but it's working out well though, after all these years. But um, you had to know somebody and you got the money. Um, and most people paid it back. They had several bad experiences. We were, Michael and I remember once, apparently somebody who borrowed money had a fire and the Oxy believed that the fire was set. Um, but they went after co-signers. They weren't shy about that. Um, and I think um, the social aspects were really very important um, to the Oxy and to life in the in the Jewish community. And I'll tell you one closing story. I was in the supermarket one day and a person came up to me. I cry when I think about this. A person came up to me and said, you know, I think about your father all the time. And my father was long gone at that point. And she told me this story about how they had had a business setback. And she came to the Oxy and she met with my father and my father got him a loan 
Um, they were Hartford business people. I, I know who these people were. They were reputable people. They were Hartford business people. And he got him a loan. And she said he saved our house. And when I think about the influence that an oxy had, and even after the banking commission took over, which in Connecticut was in the 50s, the people who ran this credit union thought of themselves as an oxy, operated like an oxy, half their members were shareholders, I should say, were not Jewish, probably by the end of my father's life, but they operated in the old style oxy. And when you're growing up, you don't really, or at least I didn't really think about what the importance of that was, but I sure do now. Thank you so much, Naomi. It was wonderful to share that with us. Appreciate, appreciate your willingness to talk about it. Um, so is there is there anyone else um, who would like to share any memories or ask any questions about what we've talked about so far? Feel free to unmute yourself if you would like to um, jump in. Um, I actually had a quick question for Professor Tenenbaum. Did the so the the free loan societies were inspired by the biblical prohibition on charging interest, but the oxies were not, correct? Correct, the oxies did charge interest, um, right. And the oxies is, um, Naomi just said, it's a totally different model. And these are credit cooperatives with shareholders, with members. I wanna point out that Jews were not the only groups that had ethnic loan societies, Japanese and Koreans, brought totally different models from their countries of origin called rotating credit associations. And with these were, I'll just give you a simple one, but they got much, much bigger and more complicated. You would have a group of 10 people. Every person would contribute $10 to the kitty every month. And it would rotate by turn of who got to borrow that $100 but then it got more elaborate. So you would pay extra if you wanted to go out of turn or be the first one. But there was supposedly a hotel in, I think it was in 1939 in Seattle that was built by a Japanese entrepreneur who supposedly raised $90,000 from one of these rotating credit associations. So again, other groups had other models that were based on their countries of origin, but correct, credit unions did charge interest which is one of the ways that they could survive. And that's why they are not philanthropic in any way. I mean, they performed a very important need, but these are, I would never call them a philanthropic organization. Right, and they were able to operate at a much greater scale, just Absolutely. because of that. Much, much larger sums than the Hebrew free loan. The Hebrew free loan, I mean, I think New York gave it maximum during my period was $500. I mean, they were much smaller ones. Okay, great, thank you. Can I listen, I, but before I tell you what's going on today, I actually have a question. So interesting to me that there were, um, like I love the ladies Hebrew free loan and, and the quotes that you put up. What happened? Did they all just spend down? Is there a bank account somewhere like waiting <laughs> to be used again? In the, case of the, in, in the case of the First Ladies Hebrew Free Loan Association, I can see that in the, by the mid 60s, they, they were uh, giving donations to various different Jewish organizations in the community. Um, so they seem to have been wrapping up their mm -hmm. bank account by, in that way. Um, so all I can see are thank you letters from those organizations, um, but it seems to have been in their sort of final years of operation. So I'm not some sure. Some incorporated right into like Jewish family services, but some of them still exist. Like There's an international association of Hebrew free loan societies. So some of the larger ones still do. Right, uh, still right. Still exist, but I some just of meant locally. Ones, they just, um, they yes, I think Elizabeth is right. They just spent down and they didn't have that much money by that point anyway and um, ended up donating it. And the Kiev is still going. 
Yeah, the the uh, the one that um, Naomi is talking about is still uh, is still in operation with, uh, as a credit union, which is um, right. and so is the Blue Hill Credit Union here that started off, I think, in Dorchester, then moved to Brookline. Um, yeah, so there still are uh, credit unions that had Jewish roots to them. Yes, and I don't know if um, Stu Roth is on the call or if he wants to chime in, but uh, but there are generations of that Kiev um, uh, Mutual Benefit Association that's still in operation. So that that is a link between the past and the present in that sense. Um, uh, looks like Lori Mandel had her hand raised. Do you want to hop in? Hello. Yeah, I do. Um, Steve Kleinman and my father were part of a club called the 13 Club. They were 13 teenagers that um, met every week and they were met every week until they all were gone. So it was many, many years, over 50, 60 years and they had an oxy and they would meet every Tuesday night and their first business was the oxy and how much money they had and what was going on. And then they played setback every week. <laughs> and <laughs> yeah, it was fabulous. So that was, there were only 13 of them and I don't think they, allowed any other members because they wouldn't allow any other members into the club. And uh, another club ended up forming, I can't remember the name of it um, right now, but anyhow, they were an exclusive Oxy. Right, Steve? I know Steve was on this call. I thought he was. He was, yeah. I'm not sure if, yeah. he, if he's still with, here with us, but. Um, okay. Thank you. So Thanks I wanted to share, share that. that. Yeah, that's wonderful. Thank, I didn't know about that one. Thank you. Um, did anyone else want to ask a question or share um, uh, share any memories of any local um, Jewish credit societies of one kind or another? How do we do it? Just like that, go ahead. Am I on? You're on, yep. Go ahead, Stuart, hey, thank you for uh, um, Believe it or not, uh, yeah, we um, are still operating the Kiev. I have been involved in the Kiev since 1970, 1970, when I first started practicing law. Um, it, interestingly, uh, the Kiev became, I think, my first client. Um, and um, I was taken under the tutelage of Ty Kronitsky and group. Um, and I have fond memories. And as Naomi said, yes, the highlight of our of our year was having the uh, annual uh, meeting with uh, Julie Kramer um, catering with his famous Kishka at the time, <laughs> um, and um, that went on for many years. We used to meet at the end at uh, I think at the uh, Agudas, either Agudas or uh, Emmanuel for, for that uh, annual event. Um, as years went on, uh, we've always had an employee. We've been living, we've been operating in um, in uh, office uh, buildings. We have an we have an office now in Bloomfield uh, with a. Um, a manager who's there, I think, five days a week. Um, and um, we're still ongoing. We operate almost in the same old fashioned way that we operated in 1970 and before that. Uh, we don't give credit cards. We don't have all these other fancy promotions. Um, and it used to be, you know, payments on a weekly basis. We finally went to monthly basis. And um, we're, we're still going and who knows, uh, uh, it, it amazes me that we're still, still around. We are a dinosaur, but we still serve the needs of, uh, of many people. Um, <laughs> we're still giving loans out. And if anybody out there needs a loan, get in touch with uh, our manager, Kiev. Great story. Thank you so much for sharing that. I appreciate it. Um, I'm going to turn the floor over to David Warren, who's going to introduce um, a little bit about what the Federation Jewish Free Loan Fund is doing uh, today in 2021. Thanks, Elizabeth. And, and actually, I'll leave most of that to, to Han. I, I just want to say briefly, um, you know, uh, Stephen Bear often says, 
particularly now during this pandemic, that um, uh, we often use the phrase bounce back. Um, instead, we should be talking about springing forward. Uh, and Elizabeth, uh, Stu, maybe Stuart, there you go, perfect, thank you. Um, Elizabeth, under your leadership and with Lance, um, the Historical Society is springing forward incredibly over the last year. The level of activity, this kind of program, and there have been so many, so just kudos, kola kavod to you and Lance and the board, um, Michael and Naomi, who are very involved, and I'm going to forget others, but really, it's just tremendous to work and to partner with you. Um, and on that theme of springing forward, it really has been the leitmotif of the work of the Federation over the last 18 months, two years, with innovation in many, many areas, I think maybe best exemplified, illustrated by uh, the creation of a, 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 re, a new free loan fund uh, in Greater Hartford, uh, bringing back that tradition and joining many other communities now. And I noticed that Tina Scheinbaum, uh, Scheinbein is on the call. Tina is the coordinator and past president of the uh, IAJFL, International Association of Jewish Free Loan Funds. Um, and Tina has been an incredible partner for us, uh, guiding us as we've moved forward, uh, teaching us over the last nine months or a year. And it's just, and, and it's such an incredible uh, 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 fraternity of, of, of philanthropists and people dedicated to, to the work that Shelley, you so well illustrated um, historically and today, such a vibrant institution in New York and Detroit and Phoenix and now in Hartford. And uh, finally, and to turn to Anne on the theme of springing forward, it really was Anne and Jeremy. And I, I'm, again, I'm gonna hopefully not get in trouble by leaving people out, but I saw earlier that Rona Golub is, is on, this, on this Zoom, Alan Rosenberg, uh, David Brandwine, a board member, a committee member, uh, and thanks to your philanthropy and your leadership, uh, and thanks to the work of uh, Jody Angel and Laura Zimmerman on the Federation staff, we've been able to spring forward so rapidly. I don't know, if, Tina, if it was you that we spoke to or others when we, at the very beginning, and we said, how long does it take to start up? And you or maybe others said, oh, that's two years, and we did this in like six months, and it's up and running. We actually have a meeting coming up, uh, I believe this week or next to talk about our, our first loans that we're gonna be making. Uh, but it's really the vision, the inspiration uh, and the philanthropy rooted in the idea of not a handout, but a hand up that's motivated Alan and Rona uh, and Ann and Jeremy and so many others to support this uh, as a binyana de ad, an everlasting edifice. The pandemic will leave us God willing, very soon. But out of this pandemic, and our friends at the foundation were partners initially in starting this, and it came out of the Rapid Relief and Recovery Fund, out of crisis, we now have a permanent new institution that, like Naomi, your dad, was able to help that family save their house. God willing, people should need it, but we know they will, and we will be there, the Federation and our leadership to help support them. So with that as background, I wanna introduce really needs no intro introduction uh, because of her tremendous work across the community. But just a couple of words about Anne. She's the founding president, passionate about Jewish education and everything Jewish. Founding president of the New England Jewish uh, uh, High School, the, the Hebrew High School of New England, Nija, um, New England Jewish Academy. Uh, she is a uh, media past chair of PRISMA, which is a national organization that supports day schools across the country. Um, she's a past chair of JFNA's uh, uh, National Women's Philanthropy uh, Division. Uh, she currently serves on the board of JFNA's, JFNA Jewish Federation of North America's Board of Trustees and is a vice chair of the Jewish Orthodox Feminist Alliance. And she serves on the boards of Yeshivat Maharat, the first Orthodox Yeshiva to ordain women uh, and the graduate program for advanced Talmud studies for women at Yeshiva University. And that's only a small piece of, of Anne's bio and her work uh, and her philanthropy. And we're so lucky to have her uh, as a board member of the Federation and as the chair, the inaugural chair uh, of the free loan fund that we've established here in Hartford. 
And with that, Anne, please take it away. Thank you, David. Um, so I am like incredibly humbled to be talking to all of you about this new Hebrew free loan after listening to Elizabeth and, and, and Shelly and Naomi. And, you know, every time you do something new and you think you're like creating something new, the new kid on the block and look at us. And then you realize, you know, you're just, you're standing on the shoulders of great people who came before us. And I am like incredibly moved by everything I just heard and even more excited that we are starting um, a Hebrew free loan, restarting or have a new one to complement the ones that came before us. Um, it's, it's actually more exciting now because it's, because it's not new and it has history. And, and um, so thank you all for already speaking. And I'll just tell you a little bit, David touched on this, how it got started. Um, it really was birthed during COVID. And, and for all the reasons that, um, that, that Shelly spoke about and Elizabeth alluded to about this, this issue of dignity and philanthropy and, and giving. And the Federation uh, and the Jewish Community Foundation launched into a amazing, an amazing fundraising campaign during COVID, uh, a COVID relief fund, because as we saw that COVID was going to be going on and on and on, and people were not leaving their homes and Pesach was coming and, and you know, what was going to happen? People started, we started raising money and people started giving money. And, um, and we began to really think about taking care of the community. And Jeremy and I, like everyone else in the community got a call and said, we're, we have this campaign going on, we hope you'll give. So when we sat down to talk about it, uh, Jeremy looked at me and we, we've been in uh, the heart. I grew up here, I grew up in Bloomfield, but I had been my whole married life and before that in Springfield, Mass, where Jeremy's family's from. And we moved back here, I moved back here about 10 years ago. And there was a Hebrew free loan in Springfield, Mass, where, um, where we were. And Jeremy looked at me and he said, you know, I'm hoping, let's all hope that, that, that the situation with COVID and issues that are coming up with people are going to be temporary. And what's going to happen, you know, um, in six months, let's hope it, when COVID's over or what's going to happen, um, what's gonna happen with the people who, are, who have lost their jobs or what are struggling because of COVID who in a million years would never, ever, ever accept a grant, a straight out grant charity from, uh, from Federation, which are, is a lot of people. Um, and he said, do you think Hartford would be interested in starting a Hebrew free loan like we had in Springfield? And, um, and, and he said, you know, maybe we could seed fund it. So I said, okay, let's, I'll call David Warren. And I called David and I said, what do you think about this idea? Uh, Jeremy and I would like to, thinking of $100,000 seed funding a Hebrew free loan in, in Hartford, if you think the community would like it. And um, he said, I think the community would love it. I love it. I love that idea. Pre come present it to the Federation board, the idea. And so I presented the idea to the Federation board and the Federation board loved it. And literally, I mean, maybe this was last April. I, I, don't, I don't even know what, day, I still don't know what day it is with COVID. If it was a year ago, it was eight months ago. But um, after the presentation to the Federation, my phone started ringing off the hook and people said, this so speaks to me. We want in, we want in and, 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 um, David mentioned my friend Rona Golub and, and Alan Rosenberger on these calls people, and more people called. And, um, and within a month or so, we had $250,000 in, uh, uh, in the bank um, for our Hebrew free loan fund. And we, so we had the money even before we, could, before we could even get a committee together, people were so excited. And so we, we formed a committee and we, um, we, 
we discussed and grappled with all the questions. I was making notes as Shelley was speaking about um, uh, about uh, you know, are we interrogate? Are we going to interrogate the investors? Are the investors? Are we going to inter interrogate the borrowers? So how is that going to look? So I'll, I'll just tell you that we have we have this committee. We we were actually officially able to launch at the end of November. And um, and we are meeting on Thursday morning or Wednesday morning um, with, uh, we have our first three loan, um, I think three loan applications in. So with that, I will tell you that number one, we, um, people who apply for a loan uh, need to have a guarantor. And it is the guarantor that we, um, make sure that they have the, the wherewithal to pay back um, and we do not interrogate a borrower. Um, we also had to grapple with probably something that was not, um, uh, was different in the twenties, like when you were investigating and researching for your book. And that is what constitutes a Jewish household and who is, who is a Jewish person who would be uh, um, applying for a loan. So we, um, uh, you need to have one Jewish adult um, to constitute being able to apply for the loan, but it, it doesn't have to be the Jewish partner. It could be um, the Jewish or the non-Jewish partner applying for the loan on behalf of a family. Um, and, and, we, and we also, in today's day and age, um, if it's a, 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 it can be a domestic partnership, it can be, uh, we make no claims on what, what a Jewish family needs to look like. And um, so uh, that, and, and the other question about um, non-Jewish non people being able to borrow money from the um, Hebrew free loan, we have a clause that um, non-Jewish employees of all our Jewish organizations are um, eligible to apply for a, a free loan with, um, with we, we were calling it the Jewish free loan of Greater Hartford, uh, just to be a little different um, than the Hebrew free loan. And um, it is very, very confidential. We have uh, two lovely women, smart women, um, Jody Angel and Laura Zimmerman, who are vetting. There are professionals at the Federation they are, they're vetting, actually vetting all the applications. They talk to the applicants. No one, including myself on the committee, knows who these applicants are. Um, and, and we will be looking at their applications blindly on Wednesday when we, um, when we look at them so that uh, we feel of the utmost importance to, you know, this is all about dignity, right? We were talking about, the Torah says that we can't, charge interest. It also says, like one of the ladies said, it's, there's no shame in applying for a loan when you, but you're not supposed to shame people. Not only is it not a shame to apply for a loan, but to, to embarrass someone is really also against the Torah. And the whole process is really meant to reflect that each person, that, that we are obligated to create each person as ourselves and that they should have the utmost dignity as they are um, applying for this loan and receiving the loan. So it's very confidential. No one on the committee knows who the people are. We trust that Laura and Jody will never tell. And um, we came up with people can borrow $5,000 for a personal loan and $7,500 for a, a, a business loan. And um, it's a three-year payback, um, and uh, and and the payback starts like two months, two or three months after the person has received the loan. Um, Shelley mentioned something, and that I want to throw out to the group: if you that some some uh, Jewish free loans specialize, they like have they have something special that they fund that people can come to you for. So for instance, we saw that um, in Miami, uh, they have a, a very successful Hebrew free loan, a very big Hebrew free loan. And, um, 
And there's a young woman in Miami who, um, who she and her husband went through a, a lot of just huge fertility issues and expense. And, um, and when they were all through with it, they said, they don't know how other Jewish couples who are going through infertility can even afford to, to do this. And so they set up a special fund in Miami for, um, for couples who, um, who are experiencing infertility to help pay for everything that goes along with trying to, to have a baby and, um, and to become pregnant. And so, although that wasn't something, if that's a lot of money, and it's very expensive, and it's way more than the five or the 7,500 we're giving, but we are really open. We're looking, we're really looking for a signature, something that we can say, you know, the Hartford Jewish Free Loan, you can go to them for X, it's been so successful. So if, if anyone has um, something in mind, I mean, we know we're, we'll get hopefully the usual, if you have a Jewish day school, you can, like you mentioned, Shelly, People can help pay for day school tuition or for a bar mitzvah that's coming up or for a roof that needs repairing or, or any of those things. But we're, we are looking for, um, for that thing. But we don't know what that is yet because we haven't even looked at the applications yet. So which we will do um, and just get a feel for if there's something in the community that people would really like. Um, and so that's, it started during COVID. It was, you know, firmed up and legal, all legal, and got all our paperwork in. And uh, by December first, and now we have our first applications coming in. And there are a few people on the Hebrew Free Loan Committee on this call. If I've forgotten anything, or if you'd like to throw something else in, feel free. And that's that's us today. Thank you, Anne. That's wonderful to hear more about it. Um, and yeah, if, if anyone uh, would like to, to contribute anything else uh, to this discussion or ask any questions um, of the people who have spoken either about the present or the past, um, this would be the time. So feel free. Can I, can I say something? Yes, please. Uh, you know, one of the things that I think I'm finding, people still don't know about us. And, and I feel that there's definitely, you know, people who have the need and it's more like the people listening to just mention it you know even mention it not necessarily to people that they think might need the loan but people know other people so you know your fellow board members or your fellow whatever and just tell them that you know we're here and we want to lend out the money I mean that's what we really want to do so Great. thank you Rana that's a great point Thank you. Anyone else want to um, make any comments or qu ask any questions? Okay, in that case, I'd just like to thank uh, thank our speakers tonight. Steve Kleinman. I think Steve someone had a hand up. Steve Kleinman. Steve, are you? Are you uh, yeah, I have a qu uh, question. Um, yeah. Has there been any outreach to Jewish Family Services um, as uh, their social workers are very aware of uh, the needs of uh, the, uh, the poor in the community? Yes, yes. And so, yes, we, we partnered and work, okay, worked very hard and continue to work very hard with Jewish Family Services. And we anticipate also that that there may be people who come to us who will not qualify for a loan, that they really need uh, the, we still have funds in the rapid relief fund uh, for people who are, who are struggling, who will never be able to be, pay back a loan. And so we are also prepared um, and Laura and, and Jody, of course, are prepared to um, send people to Jewish family services if they really aren't someone who, uh, could ever pay back a loan and is in dire need. And just and also, we, um, we've also worked with all the rabbis. We've met with all of them individually. And uh, so they are well aware of, of funds and the fund. And we also went to, you know, 
different agencies, you know, the JCC, um, uh, I don't know, I'm like drawing a blank, but you know, different, all of them, all of them, all we, of them. we try to hit all of them and to, to get the word out there. So. Great. Wonderful. Anybody else with any questions? I can't quite see everybody, but um, great. Well, uh, thank you so much to uh, Shelly Tenenbaum for joining us and to um, Anne Pava and David and everybody from Federation. And I really appreciate the chance to be able to bring together our history with our future in this, in this kind of uh, presentation. So I think um, we have learned more about both tonight and I'm glad that you all could be part of that. So thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night, everybody. Thank you. Good night. Good night.